um, our ASTO Medicaid Innovations Work Group. Um, and this seminar really serves as the last call um, for our ongoing series that has occurred over the last year and a half for um, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials Senior Deputies Medicaid Innovations Work Group. The purpose of the group um, and this call is really to provide a venue for peer-to-peer -peer learning among senior deputies and to share um, about innovations in working with Medicaid and Medicaid innovations and related topics across the states. Um, we will share more information about next steps for the work group moving forward at the end of today's call. Um, next slide. So um, ASTO's agenda for today um, is really um, to um, go through the presentations of um, Deborah Chang and Dr. Kassler. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we really get into it. Um, everyone should be muted, um, but if you need to speak up um, and you're using a phone to participate audioly, please press star six. Um, and if you're using your computer audio, there's a, a microphone icon, mine's in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen. Um, just click on it because it probably has a red X across it. Click on it um, if you want to talk. Um, we have, as I said, we have two speakers today. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of each presentation. Um, and you will have the opportunity also to ask questions um, through the audio, I mean, through the chat function um, at any time during the call. So last uh, housekeeping item, um, if we could just get a roll call of who is joining us today, um, that would be great. So who wants to go first? No takers? Okay, well, Alex, can you give us a sense of who you can see on the line? Sure, I thought we could just do a quick round of introductions here at ASTO as well. Um, so just so everyone knows, I'm Alex Curley. You probably received an email from me about today's webinar. Um, I'm a senior analyst at ASTO on the Clinical to Community Connections team, um, and I'll turn it over to Emily Moore. Hi, everyone. I'm in the room with Alex as well, and we're excited for the presentation. I'm the Director for Clinical to Community Connections here at ASTO. And I'm Deb Fournier. I am a senior director uh, at ASTO um, on the same team with Alex and Emily. Well, we can start with our presenters. Um, we have Deborah Chang, um, who is a senior VP of Policy and Prevention at Nemours Children's Health System. Oh, go ahead. Dr. Kassler, if you're if you're speaking, you're on mute. I, I I yeah, I just heard my name, but I'm not hearing anything else. Um, okay. So um, uh, I wasn't speaking. All right. So um, I'm just going to move forward with introductions of our speakers, um, and then we can go on from there. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, who is going to start discussing Nemours' recent work on social determinants of health and Medicaid. Um, Deborah Chang, as I said, is a senior vice president of policy and prevention and a corporate officer for Nemours Children's Health System. She has more than 30 years of experience in federal and state government, um, private sector in uh, the health field. Um, and her work on population health, child health system transformation, um, Medicaid, CHIP, um, has been widely published. She holds a master's degree in public health policy and administration from the University of Michigan. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Chang. Great, well, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. 
look forward to the discussion and also really look forward to hearing my um, uh, colleague, Bill, and learn more about what he's doing at IBM Watson. So I'm going to start with um, a little bit to set the stage with the Nemours journey because I think it's illustrative of the journey Medicaid directors and staff are going through as they consider multi-sector place-based approaches. It's really a mindset change for Medicaid, which is generally focused more on acute and uh, care and clinical care and sickness rather than prevention and wealth and, and prevention and health. Um, and then I'm going to really talk about um, two things. One is the work we've done under Medicaid um, on um, to look at the authorities under current law to focus on prevention and to connect to the social determinants of health. This was funded. We've been doing this work since 2016, funded by a variety of different folks, including um, Nemours, Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, and Academy Health. And... Um, then I'm going to take a deeper dive into some of the work we're doing in, or that we did in Oregon and on managed care because I understood from the group that, that you guys were interested in that. So I'm going to I guess I have 15 minutes to do all of this. And um, let me just stay on this slide for one moment and uh, tell you a little bit about Nemours. So clinically, we see 400,000 uh, patients a year in the Delaware Valley and northern central uh, Florida, and most of Nemours is a pediatric um, uh, clinical system. Um, but um, the part that I focus on is, um, you know, going beyond our walls to focus on uh, prevention, the pop population health. And, you know, one of the things that really started us on this journey was um, in 2004, really understanding that place matters, and I know you all know this. Um, but that was um, a key um, focus of ours that kind of changed the way we thought of things. And so it's the similar kind of thing that Medicaid goes through when it's thinking about this as well. It, and we made a shift to a kind of a more expanded view from a focus on biomedical to include a focus on multifaceted view of health, from acute care to chronic care, from a focus on individuals to a focus on populations. And that was a big change for us. We were thinking about, for example, in Delaware, the 50,000 patients we saw at the time um, versus looking at, you know, making all of the children in Delaware, because we're a small state, 230,000 children healthier. And that was a mind shift that we went through. Um, we also started focusing much more on prevention rather than cure and on health rather than disease. And, you know, so as a former Medicaid director myself, you know, I think that Medicaid programs are in varying stages of uh, focus on um, place-based initiatives. And so I wanted to just start the conversation in that way. And then I have a lot of slides, but I'm only going to go through a few because I only have 15 minutes. But you have these slides, and, and, and please um, use them as a resource. So the next um, slide. And um, next slide. So we started this with um, developing a kind of a roadmap or framework to think uh, to help state Medicaid programs look at all the different pathways to prevention. And you know, in doing this project, we really um, reinforced um, what we already knew, which is there's a tremendous amount of flexibility under Medicaid, both at the state level and managed care, to focus on prevention. And so this roadmap really speaks to that, gives examples. We also did some case studies, and it's all on movinghealthcareupstream.org, um, and there's a special section on Medicaid. Uh, next slide. We then went on, uh, so a little bit about the roadmap. We looked at 40 on-the-ground examples. To the extent we could, we actually included like direct links to um, waivers and state plan amendments, and so try to make it as easy to use as possible. Um, we did end up developing a progression of interventions along a continuum thinking about individual level to population level. And we designed it this way because it's how a Medicaid person thinks, right? In, in Medicaid, you're providing services to an individual uh, through a provider. It's usually in a clinical setting. And so we looked at various um, stages of prevention from 
individual clinical, the, the traditional, to more of, um, you know, when a, a Medicaid program or a, or a practice really takes that step of referring to the community and trying to make a connection to the community, to then looking at non-traditional ways of, of um, addressing um, prevention or connecting to the social determinants. Under Medicaid, for example, there's a lot of authority to use non-traditional providers in like community health workers in non-traditional settings like, like rather than clinical, childcare settings and um, YMCA, other settings, and with um, non-traditional benefits under managed care in particular, when it's a purely capitated program, there's a lot of flexibility for the managed care um, company to provide other non-value, non-medical but value-added benefits and to provide for community care coordination and type of case management, which I'll talk about later. There's also authority under Medicaid um, to cover more targeted population health efforts. And then of course, when you have a waiver, um, then you like was just passed and um, or approved in North Carolina, um, you know, you can really have a more extensive population health level um, approach. So that's a quick uh, summary of kind of how we approached it. Now I'm gonna ask you to jump to slide um, 12. So there's a lot more detail about this. I only have 15 minutes, so I um, uh, keep going. This uh, this is various pieces of the intervent of the of the here we go of the roadmap. We then took a next step, funded by Academy Health, and um, we worked in three states to really um, look at Medicaid payment strategies for prevention. And uh, the three states were Maryland, Washington, and Oregon, and we developed. All of our work has been focused on kind of how to issue briefs to look at, to help give states the tools they need um, and the knowledge they need to go upstream and address uh, social determinants and to give examples. Um, and so this is another project that's on moving healthcare upstream. It gives a lot of tools for that. If you go to the next slide, this is a summary of some of the work we did in um, three states. Next slide. Um, Hmm. Well, it's not moving, but I can say in Maryland, we um, tested a model of um, embedding a dietitian in a Head Start center to bill for services to provide uh, Medicaid enrollees, including a group counseling for healthy eating. And, um, you know, we went through the process of working with one managed care organization and one Head Start center and one dietitian and help that dietitian enroll as a provider um, in the Medicaid program and enroll as a provider in the managed care program, which then requires credentialing and other, and other sorts of things. Um, and that was a good example of um, using a non-traditional provider, providing um, group benefits in a different setting than clinical. In Oregon, um, as you may know, there's, um, it, it has one of the more um, progressive programs with uh, community care coordination systems, and they recently established a Pathways um, community hub that helps connect patients with social determinant needs to community um, services. And we worked with them to um, help um, the um, help the Pathways hub actually have a contract to begin billing for, um, for this kind of community care connection uh, for many of the services provided um, in the, uh, to Medicaid beneficiaries through this, this hub. So it's a good example of, in this case, uh, through managed care, you know, how you can make that connection between finding out that there's a need for social determinant type social services and then making the connection and the actual referral to making sure that that person actually gets the service that has been identified. And I'm gonna go into more detail on this one because there was some interest in, in this in particular. So if you go to the next slide, slide 14. So that's like two slides over. Yep, go one more. So in Oregon, I've already kind of said what we, oops, this is a go, go to the, yeah, so this is a long slide, but basically 
this was the essence of the work we did in Oregon, where we looked at the Medicaid 2016 regulation uh, on managed care to understand the authorities to cover social determinant of health interventions. The first thing we looked at, there's authority under the regulation to, for a managed care plan to provide community care coordination services. And by that, we mean coordinating between clinical and the social support providers. Um, and you can see we cited the regulations that allow for this because when you're a managed care plan, you know, you, you need to know what the regulations are and also the, the financial implications. So in terms of um, the rate setting process, which is really important from a managed care perspective, um, the community care coordination services can actually be covered in the numerator of what's called the medical loss ratio. And so it, it supports a high medical loss ratio, which, which is what you want. Um, and it's considered for uh, capitation rate setting purposes. We also looked at value added services in the white here. And these are additional services outside the standard Medicaid package um, that a managed care plan can offer um, that reduces touch of the care, uh, the need for more costly care. And so things like, as it says here, assessing the home for asthma triggers, medication compliance initiatives, you know, other types of um, initiatives that actually the managed care plan can provide. Now, in this case, this is all the regulatory um, authority, but in this case, the, the, um, while this is uh, considered in the numerator of the medical loss ratio, so it helps that area, it's not considered for um, capitation rate setting purposes. So this gives you a sense under managed care, there's a lot of authority to um, go upstream to address the social determinants if, um, if a managed care plan chooses to do so. And I wanted to spend um, my last, I'm just looking at my clock here, that's why I'm hesitating. I've got another four minutes and wanted to um, uh, tell you what else is in the packet and then talk about some lessons learned. So the next slide speaks to a Medicaid financial simulator. We got additional funding to look at helping states determine, because one of the barriers that, that states have and managed care plans have to addressing social determinants is you know, the window for seeing the cost savings is often different than um, what is expected in terms of ROI for managed care plans. So you might see the return on investment five to 10 years later. And um, that makes it challenging for managed care plans and states to focus on prevention generally. And so, you're right, because they're not seeing the savings in a, in a, in a, in a timely manner, so to speak. Um, and so we developed this financial simulator related to obesity prevent, prevention. And uh, we'll have more information released on this by the end of the year. But we um, uh, have this simulator to help states decide whether they want to look at what the savings could be over time for um, obesity prevention um, interventions. And then the next slide. Um, the next phase of our project is to look at the coordination between Medicaid and, and child care because actually Medicaid and child care, they're serving the same population, uh, about almost 50% of, of children in the younger years, birth to age five, are in um, Medicaid. And those same kids, you know, 60% of kids between the ages of birth to age five are in some type of child care system. And so it really makes sense to have these two systems of care work together and coordinate. And so again, we're working in three states in Maryland, Washington, and, and District of Columbia. And we're doing these pilots to really understand, you know, what is it that needs to change to improve coordination. And, um, and then so we can spread and scale it on a, on a, larger, um, on a larger basis. And so maybe just one more moment on this before I go to some key lessons learned. Uh, if you go to the next um, slide, we ended up doing a paper for the early childhood sector. So in this case, not for the Medicaid audience, but for other kind of advocates in the early years. And they were asking us, you know, well, what do we need to do? There's all this authority under Medicaid, 
what do we need to do to partner with um, state Medicaid agencies and CHIP agencies? And so we came up with these initial five steps that you see here to um, how to better coordinate and um, work with your Medicaid agencies. And I thought it'd be useful to spend a moment on this because, you know, many of you, it sounds like you have relationships with your Medicaid folks. Um, and, and if you don't, I mean, obviously one key thing is to find a high level champion. Um, often that's your Medicaid director, but it could be also the Medicaid medical director and other, you know, uh, staff with um, interest and experience um, um, that are interested in working with you. Uh, the other is, of course, to understand the current priorities of your state and Medicaid um, programs, because what you, under, what you really want to do is number three, is make the case for partnership by establishing shared goals around your shared population. I mean, often, as many of you know, Medicaid is, you feel, having been a Medicaid director for five years, you feel like the piggy bank. People are always coming to, we're always coming to me to ask me to, you know, finance their various programs. I think a more effective way for engagement and true relationship building um, is to approach your, the Medicaid teams with the thought of, you know, here are your priorities, here are my priorities. We have these shared goals. Let's work together so that we both can benefit from um, and, and meet our respective um, goals and priorities. Um, and, and so that's like, I think one of the most important messages. The, the, the other two points I wanted to make is obviously it helps to understand the basic structure of your state Medicaid program and CHIP program. For example, you wanna know the extent to which they use managed care. Um, for the simple matter that if you're in a state with a lot of managed care, not only do you need to work with a state agency, you also need to work with a managed care plan. Um, and so that's just an example of why it's important to know the structure. Um, and finally, you can start small with a, with a, a pilot. The, some of the things I mentioned were small initiatives, one managed care plan, one child care center, you know, uh, and, the man, and, the, uh, and the state team to really develop a, a joint initiative that is, um, you know, where you're meeting shared goals and, and shared uh, populations. So that's a quick overview. And in terms of facilitators of success, you know, obviously to have a high level state champion, I said earlier to um, develop um, or find those synergies between shared and shared goals. Um, certainly alignment of um, Medicaid and other child serving organizations or family and adult serving organizations is really key to trying to um, build that um, that trust, but also to help facilitate, you know, um, um, place-based initiatives. And I know uh, Bill's going to talk a lot about this, but it, it is an enabler to have a, a robust data collection um, and, and uh, system. And so that Pathways Hub, uh, which was developed by uh, Sarah Redding in Ohio, you know, that is um, the great thing about that system is that you uh, have an uh, infrastructure and you're sharing data among um, you know the various partners serving the same population. Um, so those are some of the facilitators. And finally, it would be it's obviously helpful to be in a state where there's a focus on moving to value. So you know there's been a lot of attention to North Carolina. Um, that's the state that now is moving to value by focusing on managed care. And when you have, you know, a managed care system, there's, it de facto creates an incentive to focus on um, providing services that are gonna address um, prevention and the social determinants because it avoids ED visits and other high cost, um, high cost services. So I'm gonna stop there because my 15 minutes are up and I'm happy to take any questions. And then I know we need to turn it over to Bill. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions at this time for um, Debbie? I'm just wondering, are we, are we sure there's folks on the line? Oh yeah, no, um, there's, uh -oh. there's a okay. number of people. Yeah, there's 34 oh, good. Yep. Oh, no. great. I, I, I couldn't see that. I just wanted to make sure because all I could see is um, a few of us. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries at all. 
All right, so hearing none, um, and just in the interest of everyone's time, I am gonna, um, we will have time at the end for questions, but I do wanna make good use of our speaker's time since I've been so generous with it. So our next speaker is Dr. William Kassler, and he's gonna discuss the use of data and predictive analytics in its application to population health. Um, Dr. Kassler uh, has spent his career working um, at the intersection of population health and clinical care. He has been a practicing primary care internist and epidemiologist, and health services uh, researcher, a public sector administrator, and has been a health policy expert. He is currently at IBM Watson Health, and he is the deputy chief health officer and the lead health officer for population health where using big data, advanced analytics, and AI, they are tackling some of the world's um, toughest challenges. Um, uh, Dr. Kassler um, has been at the New England uh, region um, of CMS and was a founding member of um, the CMS Innovation Center, um, creating value-based purchasing initiatives to improve population health. He was, before that, um, State Health Officer for New Hampshire in its Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kessler. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's really an honor to come back to my public health roots. Um, and it's wonderful um, to see that uh, so many key uh, New Hampshire leaders have made it up into ASTO. I'm thinking about Deb Fournier and uh, Marianne Cooney in particular. Um, and it's also an honor to share the podium with uh, Debbie Chang. Um, when we started the population health group at the Innovation Center uh, shortly after the Affordable Care Act, Debbie was um, instrumental uh, as a thought leader in, uh, in helping us to frame this and directly, I think, led over the years her work to um, the accountable health community. So thank you for that. Can I have the first slide, please? So we live in an era of big data, um, but our ability to capitalize on that um, lags. If you look at the National Library of Medicine and they estimate what is the doubling time of medical knowledge. In 1950, it was 50 years. Uh, in 2010, it, that decreased to 3.5 years. And in 2020, it's estimated um, that every 73 days, um, medical knowledge will double. Um, that sort of explains the huge never-ending pile of journals on, on my nightstand that I never seem to get rid of. The other aspect of this is that about 80% of that um, data is not machine readable, but it's unstructured and, and thus uh, it's dark. Next slide. As you well know, um, health care only represents a small aspect of uh, the data that an individual um, uh, is likely to generate over a lifetime. Uh, there's their genetic um, endowment, uh, environmental issues, uh, socioeconomic status, their behaviors, uh, data coming uh, from their web searching or wearables, um, uh, from social media. Uh, and we haven't used that. Yet think about, um, it's been estimated that one individual in the course of a lifetime will generate 12 terabytes of data. So a terabyte of data is, uh, is a huge amount. 12 terabytes is roughly 300,000 copies of War and Peace. Um, that exceeds the entire um, collection of the Library of Congress in terms of information. Uh, the Greek term terra means monster. And we've got to figure out ways of wrestling this monster of data. Next slide. And so AI can help to close that gap. Next slide. If we think about traditional code-centered IT as being deterministic and probabilistic, um, then we look at what IBM, for example, did in the 70s when its big blue um, beat a grandmaster at chess. It did it by brute force. It mapped out every single potential move on that chessboard and then optimized that every single time. As opposed to um, when Watson beat the Jeopardy champion in 2010 or 2011, or last year um, won a debating championship, 
Um, it, it is data centric. It is not brute force. It said that we don't program Watson, but we train it through machine learning techniques. Next slide. So without geeking out too much into uh, machine learning, I, I do want to just um, uh, demystify that a little bit uh, by saying for those of you that have a quantitative background, um, uh, I'm a recovering epidemiologist myself, um, there's a lot that machine learning um, has in common with classic statistics. Um, and, and, and it's really um, statistics plus. But I want to highlight two particular differences. The first is in the predictive power. As we know, the more predictive variables that you put into a model, uh, the less power you have in the model. So you're limited by sample size. The more sample size, the more data, the larger the uh, predictive power. But classic statistics um, ultimately end up topping out. The thing about machine learning is that um, you can throw a bunch of what we would call predictive variables, um, they call them features, um, but you can analyze orders of magnitude more variables in a model through machine learning techniques than you can with classic statistics. The other thing is that how does one get um, these predictive models in uh, classic statistics? You look at what the literature says, you look at what the theory is, you look at what the um, evidence says, and you put in the variables that you think count. Um, age, demographics, um, uh, behaviors, comorbid conditions. These are called expert systems because the experts drive that. In machine learning, um, you provide a bunch of labeled data. Um, you, uh, you, you ask it to, uh, to solve that problem. If it's right, you tell it it's right, and it reinforces itself. If it's wrong, um, it goes back and learns. And it will come up with the different variables or features um, independently. And oftentimes, um, these variables are not necessarily transparent, and you don't know um, how it weights all of that. Um, I'll talk about that as uh, supervised learning, where you give it labeled data, it, there's an answer, and you tell it when the answer is correct and when it's wrong and it learns. On the right, you'll also see something called unsupervised learning, where you just throw a bunch of data at a machine learning system and ask it to uh, figure out problems. And so where regression and clustering, um, you know, you, uh, your goal is um, to predict, um, in, in clustering, you use techniques like um, classification analysis, factor analysis, and it'll find patterns in the data. And so for um, disease description and looking for hidden patterns, um, that unsupervised learning is, is more uh, relevant. Next slide. So that's as deep a dive as I'm going to get. Um, another branch of um, machine learning that I think uh, you'll hear a lot about is called deep learning. Uh, this is fundamentally uh, an attempt to mimic the way uh, human nervous systems work uh, through uh, multiple connected neurons and, and nodes. Um, and so in this particular situation, uh, deep learning is where, um, is how Facebook will identify and tag someone. Um, it didn't start out knowing the identity of that person. Um, rather, um, it said, you know, is, is this Dorothy? And um, the user will say, no, um, that's Sarah, and it'll go back, and, um, um, and it'll weight the different nodes in order to get the pathway that gives it the right answer. So the way a human would look at that um, face and say, oh, well, that's Dorothy, it's, you know, it's kind of the eyes, and the face is symmetric, and the hair is pulled back, and it's a, and it's a woman, and, and you, you get a gestalt of how um, you would recognize a face, although a fair amount of that is in, intuitive. The way the machine learning um, uh, system, it might look at edges, it might look at combinations of edges, it may take pixels along those ever edges and do mathematical transformations, and it will then weight that in such a way it'll get the right answer, but you won't know how it got the right answer. Next slide, please. And a third component of um, of, of these AI techniques, if you will, are natural language processing. 
And by that, I don't mean simply uh, speech to text the way you would find um, in a call center, but being able to analyze a note, analyze text, understand the context of that, um, and then um, render that context to individuals or render judgment about that context. So we use that um, natural language processing in essentially two ways. First of all, to ingest um, factual data um, in um, guidelines, in articles, in documents, in patents, and whatnot, in order to get a corpus of knowledge. Uh, the way Watson won Jeopardy is it ingested Wikipedia, which is a large amount of labeled data. It read that, it understood that, and then made decisions and processes off of that. Uh, the other use case for using natural language processing is um, that it will read notes. It will read um, care coordination notes or social workers' notes. Um, it will read the notes of probation officers and, um, and guardian ad litem in, in drug courts for juveniles. Or it'll read um, electronic health record, the, um, uh, the, the texts, the things that are dictated and typed um, around uh, reports and notes and be able to synthesize that. Next slide. And, and so with that kind of deep dive into um, AI, uh, let me talk a little bit about how um, we tend to use that um, to, uh, and, and the potential to use that in, in, in population health. And so if we think about these technologies as really helping to um, drive a, a, a new precision medicine initiative where you can do a deep dive into an individual, look at their mutation, look at their gen genomes and tailor uh, drugs specifically to, the, to, to that unique person. And then you think about population health. At one level, that seems antithetical, that deep dive at the individual le level. And then the, the task of public health to deal with populations. But in fact, the same types of technologies are, are now poised to drive a precision or highly personalized population approach. And if we think about uh, the analogy of Google Maps, um, you can, with a click of a mouse, dive in so deep that you would have to actually blur out the faces of people for privacy, and yet go back and look at a block or a neighborhood or, or even a continent. And you can do that in terms of concentrically expanding denominators when you think about an individual as an individual in front of a doctor or a social worker or a care coordination a coordinator or a nurse, um, but that individual is a member of a family. Um, that individual is a panel um, uh, uh, of patients in a primary care um, office, for example, um, or an enrolled or an attributed population in a health system. Um, and then that person is also within a, a, a community, a geographically or jurisdictionally defined community where there may be public health folks looking at them. Next slide. And so the way in which we would apply all of this to that precision population health um, is first of all to look at the data, the exponential growth of that data, and to begin to aggregate different data sets through technology um, in novel ways. Integrating that data, harmonizing it, standardizing it, and then being able to develop uh, routine and descriptive reports off of that data. Um, and then to apply uh, more sophisticated machine learning algorithms using AI, natural language processing, and, and, and other analytics in order to then drive insights. Um, you can drive insights in terms of decision support at the point of care or um, a policy person um, looking at you know, quality improvement or looking at um, using uh, these data to drive evidence-based uh, uh, policies. Or you can do that at the individual level at, um, to help empower individuals to make the right choices around adherence to lifestyle um, or medication uh, recommendations. Next slide. And so I won't dive deep into this, but this is sort of the, uh, the, the, the coning out a little bit of that data fusion workflow in order to get predictive models. You start with the data acquisition 
and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the data that we have and that we leverage, but it can range anywhere from experimental data to data on wearables, uh, to data on um, behavior and social media, um, to clinical data, to data collected by social service agencies, to the variety of public health surveillance systems, um, to then um, aggregate that data in meaningful ways, to then test different models through these machine learning models. Um, and, um, and there are multiple models besides just deep learning. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm just barely scratching the surface myself in terms of understanding um, the level of sophistication of these different choices of models. But you develop a model um, on a test um, uh, data set, um, you, uh, on a excuse me, you develop the model on a development data set, then you test it um, with another data set. You then add new, um, new observations to that. Um, that then drives insight. And then when you um, have machine learning, you can then feed those results back to um, improve the model, uh, using it for prediction purposes, for evaluation, or continuous improvement. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of the data that, that we use and that we leverage. Um, we um, own a secondary use rights for over uh, 200 million covered lives um, in the uh, commercial Medicare and, and Medicaid space. And those claims data can be very, very helpful as we march individuals' experiences retrospectively through, um, uh, through their experience of care um, to develop uh, uh, retrospective cohorts and to do prediction. We also own about uh, slightly less than 60 million covered lives worth of uh, data um, that exists within the electronic health record, both the structured and unstructured data. And then we've been able to, um, we're now up to about 6 million to take um, folks in both our market scan and Explorers data. Um, and there are about 6 million folks who have, we have both their EHR data and their claims data. Um, and that um, ends up being uh, very, very helpful for the additional richness of data. Moving on to environmental in the next slide. Um, interestingly enough, IBM, not, not Watson, uh, but IBM bought the weather company uh, for its weather data, which has helped in a number of other industries. And we're just beginning to um, explore how we can use data on um, weather, temperature, precipitation as it improves the risk models and the predictive models uh, for both public health, um, think where do you uh, pre-position vaccines seasonally uh, for different outbreaks? Or where do you look at the um, emergence of vector-borne illnesses? Um, you know, so, so doing that for public health as well as, uh, for example, predicting um, exacerbations of respiratory uh, conditions and helping um, individuals to adapt. Uh, the EPA, uh, surprisingly, has very fine granular uh, data at the sub-neighborhood level uh, for um, uh, wide coverage of air uh, sensors. And so you can geocode that and, and put that into your risk uh, models as well. And you'll see on our roadmap the types of things that we're looking to leverage down, um, um, uh, down the line. Uh, next slide, please. Um, clearly, as Debbie talked about, um, the social, environmental, and behavioral uh, data are hugely important. Um, so we leverage the American Community Survey, um, and, and we do that in a couple of indices, and I'll, I'll show you a use case later on, um, where we can um, identify that um, individuals who come from certain zip codes and certain um, deprived uh, communities um, will have some unique characteristics that can help us um, further add those, um, uh, those socioeconomic information to our, our risk models. And then we build for state and local clients, for Medicaid agencies, for um, uh, states in their electronic uh, data warehouses, um, their own data um, around their social programs and around some of the very specific um, needs of their, um, uh, of their population. Next slide, please. I want to highlight one interesting novel source of data, um, which are marketing segmentation data. Um, and so PRISM um, is uh, a, a data set that segments individuals 
into behavioral and sociodemographic uh, segments. I think there are around 68 of them. Um, and they um, are, can be linked to um, very easily to uh, the zip code level um, and with a little bit more to the household level. Um, these are what marketers use to predict how likely an individual is to buy something or their consumer behavior. But when we then link that to survey data, and we have our own proprietary survey that we've done for 30 years um, uh, at around 80,000 individuals per year, uh, we've teamed up with uh, National Public Radio and, and others. And this year, um, we're focusing on social determinants, and we've asked um, many of the accountable health community um, and prepare screeners uh, for this. Um, but then you link the behavioral and attitudinal data to the market segmentation data, and you can learn a fair amount uh, about an individual and their behaviors. Um, so more than just selling it to people, you can potentially use that with their consent to, to help them get insights into their behavior. Next, next slide. And so with that, let me give you a, just a couple of quick use cases. I think the first use case for how you might use these predictive models is to segment the population, um, which is heterogeneous, into um, a more refined precision cohorts, if you will, of people with the same characteristics, the same needs, um, and thus tailor interventions um, you know, based on a, a lot of very um, unique characteristics. So one way in which we commercially do that is through outreach. Um, we know um, that um, in order to get people into care who aren't necessarily in care, who have care gaps, you're gonna tailor the, the type of outreach, the venue for the outreach, the messages um, according to who they are. So when I don't go to my doctor to get my blood pressure um, uh, taken, it's because I'm traveling too much for Watson. And um, it's very, very different from one of my patients at the community health center who doesn't go because they may be depressed um, or have substance abuse issues or might not even have an address. They may be living out of a car. Um, so you, you might tailor a high tech um, uh, outreach to me, which is just to ping me on a text. And you may have to send a community health worker out to locate um, one of my patients. Uh, again, um, simplistic examples, um, but you can think about all the ways in which you would segment uh, different population health interventions. Next slide, please. So here we're working with a, a large payer provider um, in order to use their data uh, to give reports around how their uh, medical leadership and business uh, leadership uh, can allocate resources to address high cost, high need individual. So they've, um, they've asked for maps, heat maps based upon uh, zip code level uh, census data um, and air quality data um, to focus on uh, respiratory conditions, for example. Next slide. In our care coordination um, products, we initially look at um, what we call area insights, but we create a flag that automatically happens when someone is in a, um, a high cost, um, high complexity uh, case management program. And we know using um, the area deprivation index, which is um, one of my favorite um, uh, place-based indices. It's, it's a compound measure uh, from the census of 17 non-health uh, questions. Um, around uh, transportation and housing and, and employment, but that predict with uh, highly correlated um, with not only premature death and um, morbidity, uh, but also hospital readmissions at a level of magnitude greater than diabetes, for example. So simply by flagging automatically when a patient walks in, whether they're from an area in the top quartile of, uh, of, of deprivation, then allows you to do the deeper dive. It could be the prepare screener in, in community health centers, or it could be the 10 question screener that the AHCs use, and, and do a deeper dive into exactly what are those social um, issues that, that provide barriers to care. Next slide. So beyond simply then doing question-based assessments, um, you can also use natural language processing to mine notes in an electronic health 
record or in care coordination notes. And so in, in this example, we, we built a proof of concept for Boulder County um, in which we looked through EHR notes and we identified uh, not only risks, but also assets, because a lot of the issues around some of these uh, screeners is they all talk about risks, but they don't surface assets which can be built on uh, around housing income and mental health. Um, and so you can create a, a quantitative risk score. Um, you can identify um, over time, because these things aren't static, um, the, the, the proportion of both risks and, um, and attributes and, and assets and to help, um, in, uh, to help tailor interventions. Next slide, please. So I'm going to wrap this up with just a couple of um, other examples. Um, in this situation, one of our partners, Medtronic, has a patch which can look at the interstitial blood sugar every five minutes. So think about a diabetic having a blood sugar done every five minutes. Um, through predictive modeling, we can, um, or, or through aggregation, we can tell that indi individual um, when they're in range, when they're not in range, and how well they're doing. But we can also, through food diaries and cameras, identify the nutrient densities of meals and say, here's what is going to happen if you eat that tuna sandwich. Um, and as a matter of fact, the last five times you did it, here's what happened. So maybe you ought not to have fries with that. Maybe you ought to forego dessert. Maybe we need to go to the gym. And then thirdly, um, we're now at a point where we're able to predict four hours ahead when somebody is likely to have a hypoglycemic event and thus um, give them the tip so that they can avoid going into that hypoglycemic event. All through a mobile app, Bluetooth connected to a skin patch. Next slide, please. And then lastly, turning to um, mental health. And I know I've only got a minute here. Um, I'm, I'll skip mental health. Um, I'll leave you uh, 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 thirsty for some more. Let me uh, skip this um, and say we're at a point in time where narrow AI looking at um, various focused tasks, such as recognizing images or recognizing speech, we're, we're down at the level of where humans are right now, at the human error rate. Next slide. But, uh, next slide as well. Um, but we'll, we're, we're, our, our object is not to replace individuals. Our object is um, to augment um, individuals' capacities. Um, people are always going to have skills that, at least in our lifetime, machines will never have uh, around common sense, morals, problem solving, abstraction. But these cognitive AI based systems will excel um, and beat us in pattern identification, in locating knowledge, in eliminating uh, uh, cognitive biases. Um, and not getting tired and not making mistakes. And so the idea is um, that a human will beat um, an AI system at many things. An AI system will beat a computer at many, um, uh, uh, people at many things. But together, um, I, I think this is where the technology will excel. Next slide. Um, and so with, with that, um, thank you for your indulgence um, as, as I race through, through this um, and uh, look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kassler. Um, that was fascinating. Um, I want to say um, a few things. One is if people have, if folks have questions Remember, you have to press star six on your phone if you're using your phone. Otherwise, you have to click on the microphone icon on your computer. Um, I do want to elevate a question that sort of comes naturally, I think, naturally to mind, which is um, in one of the, your more recent slides, you talked about AI being able to eliminate cognitive bias. And I wonder if you could talk about what cognitive bias is and um, how that relates to sort of more human societal bias and fabulous um, question yeah you get it and I think what is the heart of the practical and ethical challenges around AI 
So um, we know that um, we as individuals have certain cognitive or heuristic biases. Um, we tend to discount the future. Um, we tend to have availability bias. Um, we tend to have um, anchoring bias. Um, in fact, um, Kahneman won a Nobel Prize um, uh, for his lifetime of work around how we're imperfect decision makers. Humans don't have those biases. Uh, I'm sorry, um, machines don't have those biases inherently. But we know from um, certain incredibly bad examples, uh, for example, a recent Google chatbot that was uh, trained on the internet and social media and was released and immediately became incredibly racist. We know from predictive models around sentencing um, uh, that are used in the judicial system um, that they um, disproportionately sentence African Americans. Um, so AI systems are only as good as the data that trains it, um, that they're trained on and the people that train it. So although we can achieve algorithmic transparency in terms of which of those nodes in a deep learning uh, system are weighted in what way and what the path is to get that, we can absolutely have transparency in terms of the biases in the data set because every data is biased. So for example, our own claims data is biased because they're more insured than uninsured in the claims uh, data. And then you know, um, you have to have transparency around who trains it. So um, our oncology decision support is trained by Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, well, then it becomes um, obvious how uh, MSK may be different from Dana-Farber or, or from others. And so I, I think the way to control bias um, in AI is by being transparent around the data and who trains it. Thank you. Um, so this sort of leads into my next question, but I want to take a minute and, and cause I, uh, I can pepper you with questions another time. Um, do any of our participants have a question or a comment um, for Dr. Kassler or Director Chang? Okay, um, so the next question I had is really about, or, or maybe it's a comment. Um, so when, when people raise concerns about having AI make decisions that are really significant decisions for individual human beings, like predictive analytics, um, about who should have their child taken to child protective services. Um, do you have a thinking about that beyond the transparency safeguards that you were just telling me about? Oh, absolutely. You'd be surprised if I didn't. Um, <laughs> so um, if, if we think about AI as um, the science fiction of drivable cars, and automatic cars. And so I'm gonna to totally turn off my brain and I'm gonna play checkers in the front seat while you know, Tesla drives the car. Um, then, then those models, uh, those concerns are really accurate. But if you think about AI as a decision support tool, which is it's, a, it, it, it's, it's rendering the decision maker information that they then have to weigh with their professional judgment, mm -hmm. with the other data, um, um, and then it just simply becomes another input. And so this concept of the decision maker as the learned intermediary between the technology and the decision. Mm. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, AI and medical devices and how the FDA regulates them, um, one of the dimensions in which um, they regulate is, or they ask is, how independent is this? An AI system in an implantable defibrillator that will automatically decide when to shock um, is far more independent than a report that says, here's how I would prioritize your child um, protective services investigations, hmm. where, you, where you then have a social worker who actually has to push the button. Right. That's very helpful. I am... Um, I'm so sorry, we have to keep moving forward with the end of our presentation, but I want to give my um, sincere thanks to Director Chang and Dr. Kassler. Your presentations have just been wonderful. Um, Alex, do you want to um, talk a little bit about the future of our Medicaid Innovations Working Group? 
Sure. Thanks, Deb. Um, so just wanted to also say. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I just I did want to say I, I really great. This is Debbie. Greatly appreciate being on this call. And um, can you know if people want to approach me for questions by all means. Uh, do so. I really appreciate the leadership ASTO is showing in this area. And I, again, really want to, wow, what a presentation, Bill. And once again, you're doing work that's really at the forefront and look forward to continuing to um, uh, connect with you about the, the amazing work you're doing. So I, I'm sorry, I have another call, so I need to leave, but I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here on this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Debbie. much. Really appreciate it. So, Alex, do you want to tell folks quickly about um, what's going on with this group going forward? Sure, great. So, we'll keep this brief, just recognizing the time. But we did just want to let everyone know um, that due to a change in funding, ASTO's Clinical to Community Connections team will no longer be hosting these regular Medicaid Innovations group calls um, with the Senior Deputies group. However, we will be um, at the Senior Deputies Committee meeting on December 12th in Atlanta. Um, and we did want to just welcome and we um, just let you know that we're open to ideas for this work group. Um, so for those of you attending, we welcome your ideas and suggestions on the value of this type of work and ways to share information on Medicaid in, uh, innovations and um, relevant healthcare and payment transformation topics. Um, and those of you not attending the meeting, we also welcome your ideas via email. Um, so feel, feel free to email me. My email is listed here on the slide, which we'll be sharing after the presentation. And just a quick thank you as well. Um, we've listed all of our ASTO email addresses here. Feel free to reach out with questions, um, as well as a link to our Clinical to Community Connections webpage, where we often update with resources. Um, so also feel free to share any resources that you'd like to post there as well. And then finally, um, we'd like to ask you to please um, help ASTRO by evaluating today's webinar by clicking on this link. Um, we'll also be following up via email immediately following today's presentation that will include the evaluation link as well. So with that, I will conclude. And thanks again, everyone, so much for joining us today. Uh, like I said, we'll be sharing today's materials with the uh, list that's registered. And thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay, sweet baby.